The news is here, and if you're White Sox fans, the news is good. Pedro Grafal has been dismissed as White Sox manager after posting a record of 89 and 190 over almost two full seasons as the skipper of the Pale Hose. Welcome to Believe in White Sox here on a Thursday afternoon. My name is Greg Moraz. Thank you so much for joining us as always. Hit like and subscribe on the YouTube page. Also make sure that you subscribe, leave a five-star rating, and a review on any of the podcast platforms that you listen to the show on. And word of mouth is our greatest form of advertising, so make sure that you tell your White Sox fan friends about our show. Because, you know, maybe it'll help us out. Maybe it'll help us grow a little bit. So, the White Sox end up deciding on an off day, after the losing streak is over, to fire Pedro Grafal and three members of his coaching staff. The statement that the White Sox put out in regards to actually firing Grafal, I had it up a little bit earlier, let me get it now. This is what the quote from Chris Getz says in the tweet that was put out at 8.51 a.m. Central Time. Quote, as we all recognize, our team's performance this season has been disappointing on many levels. Despite the on-field struggles and lack of success, we appreciate the effort and professionalism Pedro and the staff brought to the ballpark every day. These two seasons have been very challenging. Unfortunately, the results were not there, and a change is necessary as we look to our future and the development of a new energy around the team. So, the White Sox also made a couple of other coaching moves. Charlie Montoyo, who a lot of people thought, because of his previous managerial experience as the skipper of the Blue Jays, was going to end up being the interim manager. That is not the case. Montoyo has been let go, along with Eddie Rodriguez, the third base coach, and Mike Tosar, who is the assistant hitting coach. So, Grady Sizemore, who was in his first year on the staff, that's right, the former Cleveland outfielder who seemingly tormented the White Sox at times when he was healthy, is the interim manager after joining the staff prior to the start of this season. The White Sox have also made a couple of alterations to the coaching staff to where Doug Sisson will end up as the bench coach, Justin Gershell will be the third base coach, and Mike Gellinger will be the assistant hitting coach. So, Pedro Grafal finishes up his tenure 89-190. and one of the worst two-year managerial records in the history of the club. Getz said in the press conference that happened a little bit earlier this afternoon, or I should say this morning, that this team was not going to fire Grafal in the midst of the long losing streak because they didn't want a new manager to have to answer for that losing streak. And quite frankly, I thought that was a really odd way to go about it because the streak is the streak. It doesn't, you're not going to hold the new manager to a losing streak that was under the old manager. And I just had assumed that Grafal was going to end up lasting through the end of the season and the White Sox were going to make a clean break after the year so that they didn't have to do anything different financially in terms of adjusting salaries for any interim guys, or if you're promoting people from a minor league staff, that you're going to have to increase their salaries and change roles and all that. But it must have just gotten so bad to the point where Chris Getz had to justify a reason to make the move now. And while the move should have been made back in April, because it was clear in his time as manager that Grafal was in over his head, they had to do something. And that something apparently was going to be wait till the sold out two game series against the Cubs, which begins tomorrow, and then move forward with whatever it is that you're going to do to piece together the rest of the season. I was over at the Oakland Coliseum yesterday and watched the White Sox lose what ended up being Pedro Grafal's final game as White Sox manager three to two. Davis Martin threw four no hit innings, and yet was pulled after 82 pitches and the White Sox bullpen completely gave it up. The A's scored three runs in the bottom of the seventh inning and the White Sox offense, all it was, was a two-run homer by Andrew Benintendi and some really bad defensive efforts by Benintendi and he is going to be a continual problem as part of the White Sox ability to maintain a competitive lineup just given how bad he is defensively. I wouldn't be surprised given 
that they're stuck with his contract for the next three years. I would not be surprised if Ben Intendi eventually moves into a full-time DH role just because his arm is so bad in the outfield that it's a defensive liability to have him at any outfield position. So, so Grady Sizemore, very good relationship with White Sox assistant GM Josh Barfield, and ends up taking an internship with the Diamondbacks last year, and he's only going to be an interim manager. The press conference that Chris Getz had that wrapped up a little while ago said that this is not going to be a situation where they're going to consider him for the role long term. This is just to finish out the season. Maybe he gets an opportunity to stay on the next coaching staff, but Getz said that they are going to look outside the organization for people that are already in uniform. I take that to mean active major league managers. And if you put all of the puzzle pieces together, all of them together, that lands on one guy and one guy only as the next candidate for the White Sox managerial job because of his relationship with Tony La Russa, who still has influence in this organization for whatever reason. And that's current Marlins manager Skip Schumacher. Skip Schumacher is probably going to end up being the next manager of the Chicago White Sox, and here's why. He was the NL manager of the year last year. He got the Marlins to the playoffs. But after the firing of Kim Ng, who was the MLB executive of the year, because of the fact that they hired somebody over her instead of promoting her, which was a huge mistake, Kim Ng, somebody needs to pick her up. That somebody should be the Chicago White Sox. That, that to me, is what they should do. And I'm hoping, I'm sincerely hoping that there is a front office change as well. Somebody actually pointed out on Twitter that August 8th, this is the one-year anniversary of the White Sox firing Kenny Williams and Rick Hahn. So apparently this is... What the White Sox do, August 8th, is apparently their D-Day. I didn't realize that at the time. But Skip Schumacher is a good manager. He seems to have a good blend of old-school tactics and advanced analytics. That situation has gone south there very quickly, and people were talking about Miami moving off of him well in advance of this season coming to a conclusion, which I don't understand. My guess is, is that based on the current operations there, and given the fact that they brought Gabe Kapler in as assistant GM, that they're going to swap out Skip Schumacher for Gabe Kapler. So one buffed out guy for another. Uh, Those who know me know I am not a Gabe Kapler fan from his time here in San Francisco. But Skip Schumacher is one thought for future White Sox manager. Somebody else actually put out a couple of, I think it was John Morosi. I want to pull up the tweet here real quick. Somebody gave a pretty good list of candidates that I think, and I think it was Morosi. So let me find this here. So Schumacher was one of them. John Gibbons, who was at one time a big league manager. He's currently the Mets bench coach. And he was Chris Getz's final MLB manager. I think that was with the Royals, but I can't remember uh, off the top of my head. But And then Tigers pitching coach Chris Fetter, who is a University of Michigan baseball alum, and that is where Chris Getz went to college. So maybe there's a possibility that that's the choice as well. But I think that doing this now... And putting all of this out there now at least says that the White Sox are going to have a head start on finding whoever their next manager is. I would strongly consider, if I'm the White Sox, maybe David Ross, if he is interested in coming back to managing. Because I'm not a David Ross fan, but it was clear that David Ross was a very good communicator. And... The problems that you've seen with the Chicago Cubs this year are not necessarily reflective of the job that Ross did last year. What I mean to say by that is I should have phrased that a little bit better. 
The problems you see with the Cubs this year mean that the issues they had last year do not lie on Ross alone. The Cubs effectively, with the exception the exception of Shota Imanaga, basically brought back the same team that they had at the end of last year. So I think that Ross could end up being a really good choice. He hasn't been out of the game that long. Uh, I think another good choice for White Sox managers should they want to go down that road, maybe they bring back Rick Renteria. Uh, Maybe they go for Ozzie Guillen. I would love if they brought back Ozzie Guillen. But then again, there's also the theory that you need to get somebody outside of the organization. You need to get fresh blood. I don't know necessarily who is, quote unquote, a great candidate to be the next manager of the White Sox other than the people that were put out there. But you have to put somebody in that just has a little bit better feel than Pedro Grafal did, that can communicate with players a little bit better, that is better with, you know, bridging the gap between a lot of the Latin players and the American players I don't know how you go about that balance, but I think that there is a way that you can vet the right candidate and have him be in place and ready to roll on October 10th or whenever you decide that you want to bring him aboard and have him be a big part of the evaluations process of the front office and bringing in the staff that he wants. I, what I want to see is a complete cleaned house. Whoever you bring in needs to be able to hire every single person off of their own staff. If people don't remember Don Cooper, the White Sox pitching coach for a long time was the pitching coach under Jerry Manuel, Ozzie Guillen, Robin Ventura, and Rick Renneria. You had the same pitching coach under four different managers. Now, not long in the Jerry Manuel era, and obviously at the back end of the Rick Renneria era, well, all of the Rick Renneria era, because Renneria was the manager for four years, and Cooper ended up going out when the White Sox fired Ricky. So, There needs to be autonomy with this manager to pick exactly who he wants on his staff, meaning by Ethan Katz. I just, Ethan Katz to me was somebody that was brought in because of his relationship with Lucas Giolito. I actually interacted with Ethan Katz back in 2015 when he was pitching coach for the low A Burlington Bs of the Midwest League. That was the first year I worked in minor league baseball. There was something that was just a little bit off about him. There were some social cues that I picked up from him that just seemed like they were, this is not a guy that's a great communicator. So I am hopeful that the White Sox find a staff that works cohesively together to bring out the best product around this organization. As for Chris Getz, I think that he's giving himself a little bit more of a leash and we don't know at this point how Jerry Reinsdorf actually feels about Chris Getz. And I'm sure that when they had the meeting last week talking about Grafal's future, do we know in that meeting between Jerry and Getz and Grafal, do we know that Grafal's end date was going to be before the end of the season? Or was this a decision that was made between that meeting and the actual decision to terminate him today. And you probably think about, well, you've got to terminate him on an off day because you've got to integrate the new staff members and have the interim manager get a little bit of time to get his bearings under him. So I'm hopeful that the White Sox make the right decision, but it's also going to be in regards to the personnel. And I think that the personnel is going to end up being a collaborative decision between Getz and, unfortunately, Tony La Russa 
and whoever the new manager is, but I think it should strictly be on the new manager to go out and get whoever the heck he wants to be a part of this organization. That, that to me, is the duty that your GM and your front office and your ownership group to that extent, which we really don't talk about with a lot of organizations other than the Chicago White Sox and maybe a few others such as the Yankees or maybe the Oakland Athletics. But I think that ownership just needs to, you know, let the new manager take the wheel, let him do what he wants, because it's pretty clear that the front office's decisions around staffing haven't worked. So pick your guy and let him pick his guys. It's time for a new infusion of blood onto the south side of Chicago. So I actually got to go to what ended up being the White Sox final game at the Coliseum yesterday, and I talked a little bit about it earlier, but it was the first time that I had a chance to watch the White Sox in person this year, and I might go when they come back to Oracle Park to face the Giants in two weeks. I'm not positive that I'm going to do that at this point, but My evaluations on what this White Sox team is, at least just the energy that I saw, I was sitting in the second deck behind the plate, and I just saw a team that just didn't seem like they had a whole lot of energy. They seemed like they were going through the motions, and they seemed like they were just beaten down. Now, of the guys that I did see, Miguel Vargas is a big league player. With the right development, I think Miguel Vargas is going to be somebody that will be a part of this organization for a long time. He can play third base. He can play left field. He's somebody that has got a lot of pop in his bat, and you can just tell by the way that he strides to the plate that he's somebody that White Sox fans can get excited about if he's developed properly and will probably be a part of this big league roster for some time to come. Lenin Sosa made an incredible play over the tarp down the third base line in foul territory. The third base line in foul territory in Oakland is huge. The foul territory at the Coliseum is bigger than any park in Major League Baseball and we'll never see another ballpark that has the same type of foul territory as the Coliseum. I would like to see, just given the fact that he's been shuttled up and down so many times, The fact that 2025 is not going to be a season where the White Sox win. I would like to see him get a starting role somewhere. Somewhere in the infield. I don't know where that is. Maybe they can allow him to play shortstop. Maybe he decides he can go to second base and you put Brooks Baldwin at shortstop. I don't know where he fits in long term, but... I wouldn't mind. Maybe he's the third baseman and you make Miguel Vargas your starting left fielder, which assumes that Andrew Benintendi ends up as your starting DH because you're not getting rid of that contract. Unless you find a way to trade that contract away, you're not getting rid of that contract. Benintendi himself, watching him play left field live is very sad because there are so many people that would give a little bit more effort to actually playing the position and making competitive throws back to the infield than he does. I don't understand how somebody made it to the big league level with an arm that bad. He's got pop though. So maybe there's something salvageable with him, but salvageable to the point where you're able to trade him and eat some of the money. That, I think, is going to end up going down as one of Rick Hahn's worst decisions as White Sox manager is giving that type of contract to Andrew Benintendi. Chucky Robinson is not a big league backup catcher. He's just not. The, The bat is too slow. So I don't think that that's somebody that is going to end up being a part of your roster unless you literally have nobody else that can be that backup catcher. I wanted to see Corey Lee yesterday, but understandably so you didn't because it was two night games followed by a day game. And you wanted to give the catcher that much more rest before you get up back on a plane and go back to Chicago, give him two off days effectively with the day game and then the off day. And then he'll probably be catching 
Friday night against the Cubs. Luis Robert Jr. just looks like a guy that is lost. I'm not saying like lost physically. He just, I don't know. Something about him just says he doesn't want to be here. And I think that there's, Luis Robert may have tanked his own trade value by how bad he was prior to the deadline. And I think that he may end up being a guy that, He's going to have to put in the work to get back to where he was last year in order to get traded. Luis Robert Jr., to me, doesn't look like the same guy that wowed us four years ago when he hit that 488-foot bomb at the Coliseum. As for Andrew Vaughn, I don't remember him, at least in the times I've seen him play in person, I don't remember him being that slow. He's not fast. And he looks athletic, but he just is not a fast runner at all, which means there's an understandable reason why he never would have worked as a full-time outfielder and why he didn't work as a full-time outfielder. But I'm less and less convinced at this point in his career arc that he is a long-term solution. I think Andrew Vaughn is going to end up being this team's first baseman until they can develop somebody better. And maybe a new staff can save Andrew Vaughn and turn him into the guy that everybody thought he was going to be when he won the Golden Spikes Award in 2018 and when he was the third overall pick in the 2019 draft. But I'm not convinced of that at this point. Brooks Baldwin put together a couple good at-bats. Looks good defensively. Give him an opportunity to play every day at the big league level and see what you got. White Sox have gone forever without having a franchise second baseman. So give him a shot. See what happens. There's nothing salvageable in this bullpen at this point. You know, Dominic Leone has been around the block more times than is necessary. So, you know, that's a guy that you signed as a major league veteran to fill out a bullpen. And his ERA is over six and a half. John Brebbia is who he is. John Brebbia is, at this point, not the guy that you put on a rebuilding team. Tuki Toussaint's command was just all over the lot, so he's just another roster filler. So this bullpen is going to have to be completely redeveloped and redone. And that's going to take time, but right now I just I don't see any cornerstone pieces, at least from the guys that I saw yesterday, that are going to be a part of a competitive White Sox bullpen. So you are in a situation where guys the last seven weeks of the year are going to be fighting for their jobs. Coaching staff may be fighting for their jobs, but I don't think that should be the case. You know, if I'm Chris Getz and I'm looking at you know, who I want to be an immediate part of the future that could contribute down the road. I want to see Dominic Fletcher play every day. I want to see Oscar Colas at some point get back up here, although I have to say I don't know what his injury status is at this point. I have to look that up at some point. That's for another show, so strike that from the record. I want to see Brooks Baldwin play every day. I want to see Lenin Sosa play every day. I want to see Corey Lee basically play every day as a catcher. I want to see less Nicky Lopez, even though he's a serviceable major league infielder. I want to see Miguel Vargas in the lineup every day. And maybe at some point we'll see Colson Montgomery come up and start to play. But who knows if that's actually going to happen at this point. So Grafol is gone. Sizemore is in. And we'll see somebody that was a $15 an hour intern with the Arizona Diamondbacks last year as the White Sox manager for the last seven weeks of the year. He had a great playing career. He's only 42 years old. Somebody that I think can relate effectively to a lot of the younger guys because he has been through it. He's been through injuries. I mean, that one of the things about Grady Sizemore's career that will always stick in my mind is that he was always the guy 
that people thought would have been a superstar had he stayed healthy. You know, Grady Sizemore is unfortunately one of those guys that just got injuries at the wrong times. He had a ton of talent, a lot of power, and a great defensive outfielder from the left side. But he just, he couldn't stay healthy. So maybe there's some wisdom in his journey that he can implore on some of these Chicago White Sox players. But we'll see. I don't know if there's going to be any productive development in the rest of the regular season, but maybe if some of these guys show some exponential signs of improvement, that even though he's probably not meant to be the manager moving forward, that maybe Grady Sizemore can be a part of a future coaching staff that will help develop some of these younger players into being serviceable, if not better than average major league players. That's it. That's all for today's edition of Believe in White Sox. And for those of you that have been watching, I did not wear a White Sox hat today in solidarity with our dearly departed fellow member of the Ball Brethren, Pedro Grafal. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, everybody. We will talk to you soon. Fare thee well, Pedro Grafal. We hardly knew you.